what is up you guys welcome back to the channel it's your girl JD here back with another video and today I kind of wanted to take some time out to talk about the Jennifer Lopez this is me now a love story I guess you could technically call this her film I actually spoke about the documentary that had followed it I think it was called greatest love story never told or something like that I don't know but I spoke about that over on my main channel if you guys want to check that out I will link it in the description for you but today we're gonna be talking about the actual film that was supposed to accompany her This Is Me Now album that she released. So I am a little behind, but I still wanted to talk about it because I felt like it was pretty interesting. Now, I do want to give some type of background knowledge with regards to it. So she did have to end up self-funding this film because nobody really wanted to pick up like a musical-like film. So it was just a really hard sell to these companies and nobody was really interested and I kind of don't blame them. But regardless, she ends up spending around $20 million dollars you know trying to self-fund this film and it's about an hour and five minutes long so not too lengthy but it also was supposed to be like I said already the visuals for her album but the album also didn't do so well and also when it came to her concert tickets they didn't really sell either so she had to eventually cancel her tour it wasn't doing well at all but basically people definitely made fun of both this film and also the documentary with the rehearsals and the behind the scenes they were pretty much you know relentless list over on TikTok and Instagram. So yeah, regardless, I'm just going to be talking about this as unbiasedly as possible. Hopefully that's a word, unbiasedly. I don't know. But I'm going to try to be as unbiased as possible with giving my feedback with regards to this film. So apparently there were quite a few celebrities that she had asked to be in the film with her. But they kind of mostly turned her down except for a few that we would see in the actual movie. And Jane Fonda was actually the person that was like, listen, um... Let's have our come to Jesus moment. This is not probably going to be a good idea to put this much attention on your relationship to actually make a film out of it. You know, it's one thing to make music in an album, but it's another thing when you try to make it into an actual visualizer, like an actual film. Like, you sure about this? Hmm, I don't know. Basically, she decides to move ahead anyway, and we're just gonna talk about it. So it opens to the story of Alita and Taru, which is an old Puerto Rican myth about star-crossed lovers from two warring Taino tribes. And they tried to hide their love, apparently, but, you know, Alita's father ended up finding out about the relationship. He gets mad and orders her to marry another man. So she called on the gods to save her, so they turned her into a red flower. Now, Taru Taru finds out about this and he also calls on the gods as well and they turn him into a hummingbird. So whenever you see a hummingbird moving from one flower to the next, it's Taru still looking for Alita. So I thought the beginning was kind of cute. It gave us some basis when it came to the actual storyline and what we'd see in the film. It's about a love story. So it makes sense. Now when it came to the actual film, okay, outside of the story. So one thing I want to mention before we really get into it, the film does constantly and I mean constantly talk about star signs okay there's so many connections to star signs and I'm not really a fan of that when it comes to believing that type of stuff so deeply to the point where you're turning away someone that could be really good for you just because their star sign according to your horoscope or whatever it is they're not really supposed to be compatible you know but the thing is it's like that person might have been meant for you you know what I mean so it's just like uh, I kind of understand understand why people do choose to believe it but at the same time it's just like I don't know if I could be that ingrained or engrossed in something to the point where I'm like okay yeah no I, I can't be in a relationship with you because you're a Leo or a Gemini you know what I mean like it just I, I can't really do that. We open to this motorcycle scene and it's very interesting because obviously it's supposed to be kind of like the calm before the storm. So Jayla was on the back of this motorcycle with this man that we can't see the face of, but it looks as though it might be Ben Affleck. But they're driving on this motorcycle and I guess they're going across like some water or something. I don't know. But eventually the motorcycle kind of tumbles over. They get into this accident and then she wakes up and we find out that this is just a dream, but it's just one portion of her dream. So in the other half of her dream, 
dream, I guess. She is in this factory inside of her heart, okay, where her heart is supposed to be. There's like this factory, I guess. So inside JLo's heart machine, they are trying to save her heart by giving it a red flower, but they're currently out of red flowers. So now she starts singing, but then obviously after that whole number, she wakes up and she is in therapy. She's in therapy with none other than Fat Joe. <laughs> It's very interesting they pick Fat Joe. She's now seeing this new guy and she's very obsessed with her and her man's signs being compatible, but he's kind of violent. And I'm not entirely sure who this man was supposed to represent in terms of JLo's actual life, but yeah. Obviously he wasn't that great of a guy. Now the scene with the astrological signs around this round table, we had Kiki Palmer, Post Malone, Trevor Noah, Sofia Vergara, Jennifer Lewis, and Jane Fonda. And I think she eventually decided to just support JLo just because. But I could tell in the back of her head, Jade was like, yeah, this is not gonna go well, but I'm gonna support you girl. I'm a ride till the wheels fall off. <laughs> That's what I'm getting. So I think they're kind of supposed to be the people in her head, you know, kind of giving her advice. But then there was a proposal and then a wedding, but with several different guys that they just kept switching out. So I thought that was interesting. I think that might be kind of a play on how many times she's been married. And someone in the crowd, I think it was supposed to be one of her friends in the film, technically, says, you know, I told you she can't be alone, which is honestly hilarious hilarious to me because she keeps talking about how she's okay by herself and how she could be alone now but the thing is she's never actually alone every time we've seen JLo throughout her life she's always been with somebody either she's in a relationship or she's married you know in a relationship for several years or she's married like it's never really just her by herself so I'm sure they blew half their budget on those wedding scenes alone because it was extravagant honey extravagant when it came to those decorations i'm sure half that budget went right to those scenes <laughs> i am sure of it she ends up moving on to several other guys after that and finally her friends kind of stage an intervention she goes back to therapy the therapist tells her to go to an anonymous support group for people who are addicted to being in relationships i think or addicted to sex or love i don't know one of those but i found that particular portion to be interesting because i do think low-key if you're constantly in a relationship or constantly feel the need to be with someone and never really alone to take some time to be by yourself i think you might have an addiction. I think JLo in real life might have an addiction to love or being with somebody and might very much so have a problem with constantly being dependent on somebody else to make her happy. So yeah, now she goes to the support group and there's a lot of awkward dancing. Um, it's a good awkward dancing session from each person in the circle until she starts singing her song Broken Like Me, which is a song that can connect back to her childhood, probably because she wasn't really given a lot of attention as the middle child we find out. And of course she had to make some connection back to the place that she grew up, which was the Bronx, because she always has to remind us in case we forgot. Mm -hmm. So in a dream, she's in the Bronx and she sees herself as a little girl again, but then the little girl version of herself turns into these red rose petals and then she disappears eventually. And then we're back at the factory in her heart and things aren't dying anymore. So I guess this has to represent that she maybe found love again, but maybe for herself instead of for another person. And then we had that song, Midnight Trip to Vegas, which I think is a strange place to go to when you're trying to find yourself. You know, I feel like you are pretty much just kind of drowning yourself a little bit in your sorrows when it comes to Vegas. So, but anyway, if that's what you choose to do. So she keeps saying that she eventually finds out that she's good on her own, which is ironic again, because like I said, JLo's always been in relationships throughout her, like the entirety of her career. If it wasn't some casual hookups, like with Drake and whatnot, in between these relationships and breakups with these people that she'd be in relationships with for years, she's never really alone. So then she starts dancing in the rain after her therapy session with Fat Joe. And then she sees this hummingbird, which I guess is supposed to be this grand sign from the universe to kind of tell her that, you know, you'll find love again. 
Maybe. I don't know. Then she meets a man that I believe is supposed to be Ben Affleck yet again. But they don't show his face. But they have a red flower pinned to his jacket. And then they kind of ride off into the sunset. And she kind of wraps up by explaining that Taru, a.k.a. Ben, had found his Alita which is supposed to be herself. And that's pretty much where we end. I tried to do my best to sum that up and make it make sense. But um, yeah, that was pretty much it. Here's my conclusion. Overall, it was a pretty cohesive film and it did make sense. They had the recurring themes of the star-crossed lovers and then, you know, the story of Taru and Alita in the beginning that was reinforced at the end. And then kind of obviously makes more sense when you say star-crossed lovers astrological signs you know the themes make sense they connect and i think if it was just a rom-com film of some kind without all of the singing like not as much singing and just you know have someone other than jennifer lopez in general it probably would have been received a lot better <laughs> i'm just gonna be real it probably would have been received a lot better if it was anybody but j-lo as the actual person and if it was less singing but this is supposed to be the film for her album so it makes sense why there's so much singing. I think the writing overall wasn't bad, okay? I thought it was actually pretty decent. And I also think the use of the astrological signs and kind of relying on it so heavily, it could also be a little problematic. You know, even though it makes sense, like I said, it connects back to the star-crossed lover theme. I think using it so much it was a bit much, if that makes sense. So I could see why people, again, hated it, you know? And I think the film overall kind of puts way too much pressure on your fairly new marriage. When it comes to JLo and Ben, I just think the relationship in general, it just, it had too much pressure on it to begin with. Because here you guys are after being separated from each other, because they dated back in the very early 2000s, as we know, and they decided to recently, within the last Last, what two three years what when was that that they started dating again before they got married I, I don't remember but obviously within the last few years they decided to reconnect after Ben got divorced from Jennifer Garner and JLo was no longer in that relationship with I think it was Rodriguez what's his name again is it Aaron I don't know, but that guy, the baseball player, <laughs> the ex-baseball player. So after she left her relationship, he left his marriage. They decided to come back together, reunite. Didn't take him long to repropose because he had proposed to her back in the early 2000s, but that didn't go so well. So now there's a lot of pressure to see if they're actually gonna follow through with marriage this time. And finally they do. So I feel as though JLo felt as though she had something to prove to people because it didn't work out the first time. So I just think that this film was kind of overkill. It was a bit much, even though I think if you take JLo out of it <laughs> and the fact that it was supposed to be kind of like a musical representation of her album, if you take those things away, I feel like it probably would have been decent. You know, people might have liked it, but because those two aspects were very much so included, I just knew that this was going to crash and burn before I even saw it. And after I saw people make in front of it. I knew it wasn't gonna go well and Jane Fonda had even tried her best to put a stop to it but nobody could talk JLo out of this and the fact that she even self-funded this 20 million dollars 20 million just to put on a film that's just gonna crash and burn along with the tour yikes but I feel like overall it was a decent film so that's why I'm kind of like uh like in between you know but y'all let me know your thoughts down in the comments I'll catch you all in the next one peace